Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege you give us to all gather around the table of the Lord and eat the spiritual food you prepare for us. We are praying, O oh Lord, as we look at your word today again, you help us to trust you more. And we learn to know you more. And we learn to depend upon the word and upon the promises you have given us in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today, as we continue with our study, we are going to look at Proverbs chapter 3, and we're looking at verses 1 through to 20. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 to 20. This part of the study, that is of the chapter, is talking about submission unto God. And it's talking about the reward of submitting ourselves unto God. To start with, it's good for us to know that the chapter is talking to the children of God. In verse 1, it says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. You find that that verse begins with the words, my son. In verse 11, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of correction. Again, you have my son. And now in verse 21, my son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So you find in those three verses, each section starts with my son. And then it goes on and on and on. Unless you lose interest or you are not concentrating, he calls you again and he says, my son. And then he keeps on talking. And then just about the time you are, able, you are about to make your heart wonder, he calls you again and says, my son. And so you have my son my son my son but the question is who is really talking here you know that solomon was used of god to write the proverbs the major part of the proverbs but to see is the lord really talking here because the lord and the word god the name of god appears directly seven times in the passage we're looking at today look at them with me in verse 4 so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God. That's the first mention of God in that chapter. In verse 5, trust in the Lord. That's the Lord, that's God. In verse um, 7, be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. You find over and over again that the passage is talking to us from the Lord. In verse 9, honor the Lord. And then in verse 11, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. In verse 12, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. And then in verse 19, we have the Lord again, the Lord by wisdom has founded the earth. And so in this passage, the Lord is talking to his own children. And he talks to his own children, you have my son, my son, my son, three times. And the sons of God or the children of God are described in verse 12. Look at verse 12. For whom he loveth, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. Those are the children of God. He's talking to the children of God and he's saying that these are the people that he loves. Now, what's the Lord talking to the children about? What does he want them to do? He wants them to submit unto him. He wants them to believe in his word. And he wants them to know that if we will believe in the word of God, great, great blessings are awaiting the people that believe the word of the Lord. We have divided the study of today into three parts as usual. Number one, favor for obedient students favor 
from obedient student, for obedient students. And then number two, faith in the scripture. Faith in the scripture. And then number three, the fruit of submission. The fruit of submission. We look at number one, from verse one through to verse four. Proverbs chapter three, from verse one. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. You find the word favor in verse 4. So shall thou find favor. You'll find favor with God and you'll find favor with men. So you understand why we put point number one as favor for some people. Who are these people that will have favor? Look at verse 1. My son. I could have said it's favor for the sons. Or I could have said it's favor for the sage. But I choose to use the word student. I use the word student on two counts for two reasons. Number one, your students. Number two, when we become born again, children of God, we become students in the school of Christ. Many people don't think about Christ as a teacher, as a master. But you see, the New Testament talks about Christ as a teacher many, many times. Thou art a teacher come from God. And therefore, those who are learning from him are the students in the school of Christ. Also, if you pick up that word, disciple, which we have many, many times in the New Testament, disciple means a learner. A learner is a student. And when we actually talk of the disciples of Christ, we're talking about learners from Christ, the students of Christ. In Matthew chapter 11, from verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy, and I will give you rest. Here is Christ making the invitation and calling everyone, saying, Come. You are restless? Come, I'll give you rest. You have no peace? Come, I'll give you peace. You are carrying a heavy burden? Come, I'll lift the burden up for you. You do not know success? Come, I'll give you success. You do not know the joy of the Lord? Come, I'll give you joy. You want blessing in your life? Come, I have blessing to give unto you. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then it says, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. You come to Christ, you come to learn. Therefore, you are a child of God when you believe on the Lord. You are a servant of the Lord because you are going to serve the Lord. You are also a student in the school of Christ because you are going to learn of Christ. You are going to see the ways of Christ. You are going to hear the words of Christ. You are going to learn of the wisdom of the Lord. And you are going to follow after everything, learning of Him. You understand then, you are not just an ordinary student at school. You are also a student of the Lord. That's why we have point number one, as favor for obedient students. Students at school, oh yes, if they are obedient at school, if you are obedient in the school, you are going to have some favor. But then you are also a student in the school of the Lord. If you are obedient to the Lord, then you are also going to have favor. Come back to Proverbs chapter 3 verse 1. My son, forget not my law. Again, we have to stop here and uh, talk about uh, those words. My son, how does a person become a child of God? A son of God or a daughter of God. The scripture teaches us how you can become a child of God, how you can become a son of the Lord, so that the Lord can refer to you as my son. And then the rest of the things will follow. In John chapter 1, John chapter 1, verse 12, 4, but as many as received him, 
To them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You have Christ presented unto you as the Savior. You have Christ presented unto you as the Lord. And then you receive the Lord. It says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come in unto him. You accept the Lord. You receive the Lord. You receive forgiveness from the Lord. The grace of the Lord. The salvation of the Lord. As you receive him and his salvation, then you become a child of God. You believe on the Lord. Even to them that believe on his name. But to see if that is going to be a reality, it means that there must have been repentance in your life. Repentance would have taken place. Why do we say that repentance must take place before you become a child of God? Because uh, I don't know whether you have uh, sometimes heard uh, in our various uh, Christian classes, when the teachers want us to keep quiet, they'll say, everybody pay attention. Who is a child of God here? If you are a son of God, a child of God, son, daughter of God, can you raise up your hand? And everybody will raise up their hands. And then it says, now if you are a child of God, a child of God will not make a noise. If you make a noise, you are not a child of God. If you stop making a noise, then you are a child of God. And then we all keep quiet. And then the person talking to us will say, fine, wonderful. I knew you will keep quiet because I knew you are children of God. Praise the Lord, we are children of God because we are not making a noise. Is that scriptural? I said, is that scriptural? No. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 16, and watch agreement as the temple of God with idols. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Look at verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Listen to this. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You see, I am a child of God. Come out from among them. Among the people that are doing evil, that are walking in darkness, that are living in sin, you repent, you turn away from those sins, you separate yourself from all those activities of worldly people, of sinful people, of backsliding people, and you come to believe on the Lord. And the moment you put your face in the Lord, having turned away from everything that is evil, then the Lord said, I will be a father unto them, and they shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. It is then the Spirit of God himself will bear witness with your heart that you are a child of God. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Reading from verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You see the sons of God there again? You are born again now. You are born into the family of God. God is your father. You are a child of God. As a result of that, now you are being led by the Spirit of God. And it leads you according to Scripture. And it leads you in the light. And it leads you in the truth. And you will not do anything that is contrary to the Word of God. As many as have been led like that. And they are walking in the light and walking in the truth. They shall be called the sons of God. Now you come back to Proverbs chapter 3. And we're looking at verse 1 to verse 4. My son... Are you born again? Are you a child of God? Have you repented of your sins? Have you believed on the Lord? My son, if you have taken that step, and the Lord is not referring to you as a son, forget not my Lord. Remember, you are learning. And many, many people forget what they learn. They learn the word of God, but they soon forget. But he's telling us, you must not forget the word of the Lord. How will you not forget? But let them, let thine heart keep my commandments. Keep it in your heart, keep it in your memory, and keep it in your, uh, in your life as well. If you do that, 
what will be the result in your life now we're looking at the benefits we're looking at the blessings that you are going to have if you keep the word of god as a child of god in verse 2 for length of days and long life and peace they shall add unto thee you will have peace when you're obedient to the word of god you will have long life when you are obedient to the word of god you'll have the length of days you say what's the difference between length of days and long life there's no difference they are the same it means you will live long and he wanted to emphasize that to you he says it the second time again he says length of days he says long life you will have will be added unto you if you love the lord if you obey the lord uh, there was a man in the bible he became so sick and when he was sick a prophet was sent to him and the prophet told him set your house in order because you will die and that man came to the lord he turned his face to the wall he said lord why will i die have i not been obedient to you have i not lived a life as a child of god why are you saying that i'm going to die at this time oh lord don't allow that to happen and then the lord said i answer your prayer and he added 15 years to his life what's his name Ezekiah. Now look at that verse 2 again. If you are obedient to the Lord, like Ezekiah was, then you'll be able to pray with confidence. You will say, Oh Lord, but I'm your child, and I'm obedient unto you in the day and in the night, at school and in the church, in our community everywhere. Everybody knows that I will not want to do anything contrary to your word, and then length of days and long life and peace shall they add unto thee. In verse 3, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. That means always speak the truth. Always hold on to the truth. Always embrace the truth. And always be merciful and bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. What's the blessing in that? What's the benefit in that? What's the consequence in that? In verse 4, so shalt thou find favor and good understanding. For in the presence of the Lord, and also in the presence of man. In uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. Still telling us the benefit of obeying the Lord. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Look at the benefit. For they are life unto those that find them. You find the word of God, you obey the word of God, you live by the word of God, they will be life unto you and health to all their flesh. Health to all their flesh. That means then you have favor from the Lord. The goodness of the Lord will be upon your life and the promises of the Lord will be fulfilled in your life everywhere you may be behave as a child of god let the grace of god be manifest in your life and then you'll find that the blessings of the lord will be abundant in your life now we go to point number two faith in the scripture again i need to explain this uh, let's uh, look at uh, proverbs now chapter three reading from verse five through to verse ten trust in the lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be hell to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruit of all thine increase, so shall thy bones be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine now you see these verses i have read it talks about the lord and it talks about the sons or the children of the lord remember from verse one it's addressing the people that are referred to as my son my son my son what's he telling them he's telling them number one trust in the lord it's telling them number two in all thy ways acknowledge him 
Number three, it's also telling them, depart from evil. Number four, in verse nine, it says, honor the Lord. You see what the Lord is telling us here? If you are a child of God, how do you reveal that you are a child of God? You are trusting the Lord every time. You lean upon the Lord every time. You believe the Lord every time. And then it even says, fear the Lord in verse 7. It says, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Then it tells us uh, some things you will not do if you are trusting the Lord. Look at verse 5 again. Lean not unto your own understanding. Some people say, my heart is my God. Those ones are not believers. If you are a believer, is your heart your God? I said, is your heart your God? No, it cannot be. If you are trusting in the Lord, you'll not be trusting yourself and saying, I know myself, I know my heart, my heart is my God. Those are, that's the word of unbelievers. Lean not unto thine own understanding. How do you know somebody leaning upon his own understanding? Uh, we tell him something, we say, look at the word of God. He shakes his head and says, no, I don't accept that. The people that argue a lot, I know what I believe. I know what I stand for. I don't accept that one. My heart will never deceive me. My mind will never deceive me. You are leaning upon your own understanding. And it says, if you are trusting in the Lord, you will not at the same time lean upon your own understanding. Those who lean upon their understanding, they are not teachable. You cannot correct them. You cannot talk to them. They will not listen. They are full of themselves. And that is not good. But it says in all thy ways, acknowledge him. Anywhere you want to go, any place you want to go, ask the Lord. And say, I will not go anywhere where the Lord will not go with me. I will not go anywhere where I cannot pray. I will not go anywhere where my conscience will not be free that the Lord is here with me. Because in all my ways, I acknowledge the Lord. That is, I take knowledge of the Lord. That the Lord is with me. And then it says, He shall direct thy paths. Then it says, once again in verse 7, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Listen to counseling. Be not wise in thine own eyes. If you are being told, that way is the way of perdition. That way is the way of destruction. Be not wise in thine own eyes. That decision will ruin your life. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Then in verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with thy substance. Whatever little thing you have, you honor the Lord. If you honor the Lord like that, then it says, There will be blessing in verse 10. So shall thy bands be filled with plenty. You honor the Lord by giving your strength to the Lord. There are some young people that say, I don't know I'm going to give anything to God because I don't have money. And I don't have anything I can give to the Lord. Well, you have some intelligence, give it to the Lord. And you see to witness. You have mouth, you have your voice, you see to pray. And you see to sing the praises of the Lord. You can do a lot of things, walking in the household of faith, in the church. You use your strength, you use your understanding, your intelligence for the Lord. And then it says the blessings will come upon you. So shall thy pants be filled with plenty. When it says pants here, what does it mean? It's uh, the place where the farmers gather the produce of their farm. Maybe it's yam or potato or granite or whatever it is. They have the pants. They have the house where they put the harvest. And it says if you honor the Lord, God will give you so much that your pants will be filled with plenty. And then it says, thy presses shall burst out with new wine. The wine here is not alcohol. You need to know that uh, if you study your science to that point and you understand, when you have uh, the fruit of the vine or the fruit coming from orange or something that they even make from banana, once it has not fermented, it will look sweet and fresh. And you drink that, uh, you may call that just um, juice, orange juice, or it's the juice of apple, or it's the juice of what we call raisins, or it's the juice of a uh, grapefruit, and that one doesn't do any harm to anyone. 
but when it ferments, it's no more new wine, it becomes strong drink. So he's saying here, if you honor the Lord, he'll bless you so much, and then your presses will burst out with new wine. But I've entitled this faith in the scripture. Why do I title it faith in the scripture? Because it says in verse 5, trust in the Lord. It says in verse 6, acknowledge him. It says in verse 7, fear the Lord. It says in verse 9, honor the Lord. You say, but this thing is talking about the Lord. Why didn't you say faith in the Savior? Because if I said faith in the Savior, that will still keep what I wanted. And the Savior is the Lord. And the Lord is the Savior. So I could easily have said faith in the Savior. But I have said faith in the Scripture deliberately because I want you to understand many people don't understand when we say trust in the Lord you cannot see the Lord face to face you cannot see him directly how do you have faith in the Lord there's only one way to have faith in the Lord have faith in his word why do we have faith in his word because he's a God that will not lie because he's a God that is always truthful in Titus chapter 1 and in verse 2, Titus chapter 1, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, he cannot lie. Therefore, his word is truth. When it says trust in the Lord, it simply means trust in the word of the Lord. As God said something, as God promised something, when you say, I have faith in God, I have faith in God, some people don't understand when they say, I have faith in God. What does it mean? It simply means, I take God at his word. He said so in his word, and so it is, and so I stand upon it. Because God cannot lie. Faith in God is faith in the Savior. Faith in the Savior is faith in his word. In Hebrews chapter 6, Reading from verse 18, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Impossible for God to lie. That's why we say trust in the Lord means trust in his word. It means trust in the scripture. It means believe the word of God. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 12. Remember, trust in the Lord means trust in his word. Believe the Lord means believe his word. Have faith in God means have faith in the scripture. Jeremiah chapter 1 and in verse 12. Then said the Lord unto me, thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. I will hasten my word to perform it. You see that? I'm trusting in the Lord. What do you mean? I'm trusting in the word of God. I believe the Lord. What does that mean? I believe the scripture. I believe the word of God. I know God will not fail. What does that mean? I know scripture cannot be broken. I know that the word of God cannot fail. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 27. Acts chapter 27 verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me i believe god what do you mean paul by believing god well i believe the word of god i believe that what is said is true i believe that that word cannot fail i believe god i believe the scripture so the next time you read the word of god you ask yourself do i believe god if you say yes then do i believe the scripture believing god is believing the scripture that everything totally is the word of God. Come back to Proverbs chapter 3 and in verse 5. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5. Trust in the Lord. Verse 7, middle of verse 7, fear the Lord. Verse 9, honor the Lord. Here we are being told we need to trust in the Lord. We need to fear the Lord. We need to honor the Lord. I must remind you once again, when we say fear the Lord, it doesn't mean that uh, anytime you hear the name of God, then you panic. Then you become frightened. 
then you're afraid. Then you're looking for somewhere to hide yourself. And you say, what's the matter with you? You say, because I had the name of God, and I'm told to be afraid every time I had the name, I hear the name of God. No, that's not it. To fear the Lord simply means F, you have faith in God. E, that means to eschew evil. A, that means you acknowledge the Lord. And R, that means you reverence the Lord. It means then you have faith in the Lord. And because you have faith in the Lord, the Lord is always there. And the word of God is true. If he said he will do something, he will do it. Because of that, I have faith in him. I fear the Lord. And I also hate evil. I eschew evil. I run away from evil. I shun evil. Why? Because I fear the Lord. If you fear the Lord, you are going to run away from evil. Because you fear the judgment of God. Then you acknowledge the Lord. You know that the Lord is omnipresent. The Lord is always there, and the Lord is omniscient. He sees everything that I do. Therefore, you acknowledge him every time that you reverence the Lord. That means you adore him. You worship him. You recognize the presence of the Lord. And because the Lord is there, you will not do anything that the Lord will not appreciate. In uh, Psalm 37, reading from verse 3, trust in the Lord, the same thing, and do good. And so shall thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. You see the blessing here. It says, if you will trust in the Lord, and you keep on doing good, and you don't backslide, it says, you will dwell in the land safely. And then in the time of scarcity, in the time of need, in the time of famine, you will be fed. Then it says in verse 4, delight thyself also in the Lord. And it shall give thee the desires of thine heart. You see, there are some people that say, eh, Well, I'm too young to serve the Lord. I'm too young to follow the Lord. And because I'm too young to follow the Lord, I will not follow the Lord now. I need to study this one. I need to study this one. I need to study that one. And if I need to study, how can I be following the Lord now? Look at this in verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord. And he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. I'm sure you know that many years ago, I was uh, a student like you are a student now. And uh, in fact, uh, I've been very, very religious before I became born again. But thank God, the Lord, uh, you know, brought the gospel to me. And then I believed the gospel and I became born again. And when I became born again, then I, you know, went to university. I was born again before I went to the university. And I started studying in our class. We were very, very small in our class. Because everybody ran away from that subject. Uh, they felt that nobody can touch that area. And especially in the place I went at that time, University of Ibadan. Because content was very, very heavy. And, uh, you know, everybody started running away from the class. And eventually, it remained just very, very few of us. And uh, even the few people that remain, some will take us in this other department to add to the mathematics so that because if they took mathematics alone, they thought that will mean that uh, they were signing the, uh, their failure. But uh, I kept just that uh, mathematics alone. And then the people said, if you are in that department, you'll not have time for any other thing. I said, but I'm a Christian now. And at that time, I had a program of reading the Bible. And I will read from chapter to chapter to chapter. I didn't know I would become a pastor at that time. I just loved the Lord. Just delighted in the Lord. Not only that, I was even taking some music lessons. And I will learn the theory of music. And I had a place. I'll go and practice the piano. They said, if you are that serious, you are into religion, into Christianity, into church service, into praying, into everything. If you are like that. And you are not in a department when anybody can just do anything. And uh, well, I said, I trust in the Lord. I had a desire, and I don't know why the desire was there. I just had a desire that I was going to top the whole university and the whole class. And uh, so some people said, you think you are brilliant. You think you can make it. And you are this serious with music and with church and with reading the Bible and reading other Christian literature. But I kept on like that. Of course, I did my work. I did all my assignments. I attended all the classes. I read all the library books I wanted to read. But I delighted in the Lord. And by the grace of God, I made a good grade. 
and uh, one of those people in our set at that time, I'm talking about 1967 when I graduated from university, and then uh, somebody like that who was, uh, you know, in the same set and finished 1967, uh, came for counseling and uh, said, praise the Lord, I'm now a believer. I said, praise the Lord. And then he, he said, she said something, a woman. She said, you must forgive me for this one. I said, no, don't worry. He said, we used to think that you people, especially you, pointed at me that uh, something was wrong with your head. Uh, because we thought you were in, the, in that department where things were difficult and religion, religion, religion. And uh, when you came out in that uh, first class, we knew that uh, your head is correct, nothing wrong with your head. Now you see, delight in the Lord. If you delight in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. And you are going to succeed in Jesus' name. In verse 5, commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. He shall bring it to pass. He will do it in your life in Jesus' name. So don't let anybody tell you that if you believe the scriptures, if you are following the Lord, then you will not be able to make it. You will not be able to study. You will not be able to do everything you ought to do. You will do it and you will excel even more than everybody in Jesus' name. Now, we go to point number three. In point number three, we have the fruit of submission. The fruit of submission. Reading from Proverbs chapter 3 and in verse 11. My son, my son again. You see the Lord is talking to his own children. He says, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. That chastening of the Lord is the correction of the Lord. Neither be weary of his correction. The Lord will be correcting us many, many times. But wait a minute. The Lord doesn't come down from heaven and then come to correct us directly. The Lord can use me while I'm preaching to you to correct you. And then you will say, yes, I realize now. From what the pastor is teaching and saying, the Lord is correcting me. I am wrong on that area. Or the Lord may use a fellow student who is a child of God and will challenge you and say, ah, brother, why are you doing that? We, we expect something greater from you. We expected that you will live a life that is challenging. Your life has always been challenging. How could you say what you have said now? How could you do what you have done now? That's the correction of the Lord. Or it may just be a sister that will tell you and say, I am disappointed. I couldn't believe my eyes that you are the one doing something like that. Uh -uh. We have always looked up at you up there, knowing that you are a child of God, and your life has always been encouraging to us. How could you do that? When that young sister says that to you, it's not just that sister talking or that brother talking. It's a correction of the Lord. You will not despise that and belittle that. I said, like, go away. Who are you to talk to me, by the way? Do you know what I know? Do you know the reason why I did that? Do you know my intention? If you say that, you are despising the correction, chastening of the Lord. In verse 12, for whom the Lord loveth, he corrected, even as a father, the son in whom he delighted. One of the good things to find in every family is the privilege of being corrected whenever we are wrong. And if uh, we are wrong and we are not corrected, what does the Bible call us? Look at it. You need to know this verse. In um, Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, I want you to see what the Bible calls the people that will not uh, take correction. Or the people that uh, are never corrected and, uh, you know, people, oh, he's so, leave him alone. Leave her alone. She is like that. He is like that. We have talked, talked, and talked. He will never listen. She will never listen. He leave her to herself. Who are the people they do that to? Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, Despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faith when thou art rebuked of him. The correction is called the rebuke here. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Verse 8 is important. Now we're going to read this verse 8 together. After 2, you read it aloud. I will hear you here. After 2, 1, 2, go.
You see that? It says, but if ye be without correction, without reproof, without chastisement, whereof all are partakers in every family, there should be correction. And of course, in the church of God, there should be correction. Uh, you know, some young people, if uh, leaders in the church uh, calls uh, them, call them and say, Ah, sister, uh, why did you do this? That even an adult like that, who is old enough to be your teacher at school, old enough to be your principal at school, will even show respect to you and honor you and say, Sister, why did you do that? You should even be happy. That we who are adults, we are not looking so down upon you to say that uh, after all it's a little child and just call you by your name and say so and so, why are you, why are you doing this? We even call you sister, we even call you brother. Why did you do that? If you are so lucky to have somebody to correct you like that, instead of running away, instead of just, uh, you know, raising the shoulder, instead of using your eyes to uh, i don't know whether this word is dictionary but i'll use it because that's uh, you know what young people do to commonize do you understand uh, that is they use their eyes and then when they make their eyes and they turn like their hair like this uh, people will say see that girl he knows how to commonize somebody that is how to make belittle somebody how to make somebody feel so small you'll be regretting why did i correct her why did i correct him we must not do like that because if all are partakers of the correction and we are not partakers of the correction then it means we are not real children but we are bastards i pray none of us will be bastards in jesus name but you know in verse in chapter 3 of proverbs proverbs chapter 3 looking at it from verse 13 happy is the man that findeth wisdom he returns now to the message of wisdom how are we getting this wisdom when you are corrected and you take correction that's how you get wisdom I want to ask you, how did you learn to speak English? You spoke, you made a mistake, you were corrected. You spoke again, you made another mistake, you were corrected. The process of speaking, making mistakes, and being corrected is a process of learning. And eventually now, you can speak very well. How do you learn the subject now that they say you are the best student in that subject in your school or in your class? You learn to it. You did your assignment, you made a mistake, your teacher corrected you, you took correction, you did another assignment, you had correction, you were corrected. That's how we have wisdom in the school of life. And we do, when we're doing something, how do we do something perfectly, effectively, that people will say, ah, that man is wise, that woman is wise. It's by taking correction. You did something, you made a mistake, you were corrected, you took correction, you did another thing, you made a mistake, you were corrected, you took correction. The process of taking correction, taking correction, taking correction is the process that makes us wise. That's the thing that gives us wisdom. If you want to have wisdom, there's only one way. All the things you are doing, you will be taking correction, correction, correction. And then will you be wise and you'll become happy in your life in Jesus' name. In verse 13, happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth, getteth understanding. For the merchandise trading of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. You see what he's saying here? He's saying that if you get wisdom, if you get understanding, it is higher, it is better, it is greater than uh, silver or gold. What does that mean? What it means is simply this. For example, let me give you an illustration. There are some uh, students, they ought to be here with us now, but they are not here. Maybe they decided, or their parents decided, they'll make them to go and sell something. Sell bread, sell milk, sell some little, little things, and bring silver and gold money into the family. Well, that student has gone to sell something, and you have come here to study the Word of God. What is the comparison of what you get with what they get? They get money by trading. You get the knowledge of the Word of God by studying the Word of God. The merchandise of it, the getting of the wisdom, the understanding, is more than that of silver and gold. Give time to reading. Give time to studying. 
give time to the word of God, you will be much, much better than the people that are giving their time to making money at this time. In verse 15, she is. That's the wisdom. I told you before that wisdom is sometimes personified. She, wisdom, is more precious than rubies. All the things that thou canst uh, desire are not to be compared unto her, not to be compared unto wisdom. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand, riches and honor. Uh, you know, uh, when I was a student, and I was already born again, uh, whenever preaching was going on, I'll be taking notes, I'll be taking notes. At that time, I didn't know I was taking, I just love taking notes. Whenever I hear the message of the word of God, those days, I had a notebook like this. It's just like my, the same kind of notebook I was using at the university. I said this one is for pure math, that one is for analysis, that one is for complex variables, that one is for, uh, you know, taking notes uh, for scripture, for preaching. And, uh, you know, I had a notebook for the preaching. I had a notebook for the mathematics. And every time I went to church, I took my Bible, I took my notebook. All the other Christians, born again Christians, they'll be looking at me like this. They'll say, this fellow, he even makes the church a school. And every time the preacher is preaching, they just enjoyed the message. I enjoyed the message too, but I will write and write and write and write. And then I will put titles on them. By the time I came out of university, and then I went to secondary school to teach. It was very easy for me to lead the student I was leading then in the Christian faith because I had notebooks that were full of messages. And those students that I was leading at that time, I just get to my notebook and look at that uh, topic and then bring something out and teach them. Even when Deeper Life started, already those notebooks were there. The messages were there. The things I learned, they were there. They now helped me to be able to teach other people. Why do I tell you that? I tell you that so that you will do the same thing. And if Jesus tarries in the future, you will do something good for the kingdom of God. I said you'll do something good for the kingdom of God. You will get wisdom. You will get understanding. You will get knowledge. You will get honor as a result of those things you are taking note of and you are applying them in your life. In verse 17, our ways are the ways of pleasantness and all our paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her and happy is everyone that retaineth her. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. You see what wisdom can do? This beautiful world that you see, it is a wisdom of God that has made it. And then it says, by understanding, has established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down in the dew. In a Proverbs chapter 4 verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing, is the essential thing, is a central thing, is a great thing, it's an indispensable thing, you cannot do without it. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. If we will get all that in our lives, a lot of benefits will come to us now and then as we're growing up and as we grow up fully and we'll serve the Lord without any interruption and without any failure in Jesus' name. We're going to rise up and we're going to tell the Lord in our prayer that we're going to be totally submissive unto the Lord. Are you being corrected in the family? How do you take the correction? Do you frown? Do you push them away? Do you say, I don't want anybody to talk to me about anything. I don't want correction. Don't reject correction. Taking correction is a path of wisdom. And then serve the Lord now while you are young. Serve the Lord now while you are young. Serve the Lord now while you are young. Many blessings will come to your life as a result of serving the Lord. Make up your mind. Have faith in the scripture. There's favor for those who are obedient students. And also there is a fruit, the benefit of submission in our lives. All to Jesus I surrender. Surrender your heart. Surrender your will. Don't be stubborn. Don't reject the correction of the Lord. If the Lord is pointing out something that is not right, drop it. If the Lord is correcting you about the friends you are keeping, drop them. 
If the Lord is telling you about your laziness, drop that lazy habit. If the Lord is telling you about the way you talk, your language, take correction. There is wisdom for those who take correction. We have wisdom in life, we increase in understanding by taking correction, taking correction, taking correction. It will bring wisdom into our lives. And whenever you hear the messages, take notes. Take notes. You don't know what you are going to use that for tomorrow. It will make your life better. And instead of running to the street and selling and selling and selling, plead with your parents that this time now that you are young, you give time to study. Studying your lessons. Studying your subjects at school. And studying the word of God as well. Because of all the things you can get, wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. Knowledge, understanding, discretion, all those things are very, very important. Serve the Lord now that you are young. Serve the Lord now that you are young. Trust in the Lord. Fear the Lord. Delight in the Lord. Honor the Lord. Give the Lord your heart. Serve him. Remember him in the days of your youth. A lot of blessings will come upon your life.